May all beings have happiness and create the causes of happiness. May they all be free from suffering and creating the causes of suffering. May they find that noble happiness, which can never be tainted by suffering. May they attain universal impartial compassion, free of worldly bias towards friends and enemies. Dungal tang dungal chichu tang trawa ju tik dungal me pe de wa tampa tang min rawa ju tik nearing chak tang ni tang drawe tang nom chempo la ne pa ju tik. Okay, everybody, it's lovely to see the ones that can get on. I'm very happy. You are late. <laughs> So tonight, we are going to do Stress and Anxiety, Leaping into Fearlessness, the second part. So for those that weren't here last time, I will give a little bit of a summary in a few moments. But I think it's a very important subject because I think we live in this world really with so much stress and so much anxiety. And I think that the whole Buddhist is absolutely wonderful in terms of stress and anxiety. I think it gives you a wonderful way of being fearless as we discussed last time. And fearlessness doesn't mean not having fear, it means dealing with it in a completely different way. So I'm going to start with some stories and then if Kathy can play those, just let me get the story first. And then we will go on to our little cartoons that I've just pushed. Marcella I like seeing your face. It's nice. Okay. So this story is, during a time of civil war in Korea, a certain general led his troops through province after province, overrunning whatever stood in his path. The people of one town, knowing that he was coming and having heard tales of his cruelty, all fled into the mountains. The general arrived in the empty town with his troops and sent them out to search the town. Some of the soldiers came back and reported that only one person remained, a Zen priest. The general strode over to the temple, walked in, pulled out his sword and said, Don't you know who I am? I am the one who can run through you without batting an eye. The Zen master looked back and calmly responded, and I, sir, am one who can be run through without betting an eye. The general, hearing this, bowed and left the temple. It's a very important thing, you know, because everybody in their fear runs and is really, really quite crazy about, you know, when there's any stressful situation. So, Kathy, just put on the first little worry the first little worry, Schultz. I think Schultz was so clever with his beautiful, if you can, that I just sent you now, if you can, that's wonderful. He was such a wonderful thing. So it's Lucy and Charlie Brown. She says, do you ever worry about the world getting blown up, Charlie Brown? And he says, it depends what day is today. She says, Tuesday he says, no, well, on Tuesdays, I worry about personality problems. Thursday is my day for worrying about the world getting blown up. Okay, I think he says it so beautifully with all the stresses that we all have. And the second one, Kath, if you can go to it, the second stress one, um, which is also shorts, if you could get it. Second one I sent you. He says, um, she says, what are you two standing out looking so worried about? And Charlie Brown says, we're worried. We're afraid of the future. And then she says, are you worried about anything in particular? He says, oh, no, we're worried about everything. So the little one says, yes, our worrying is very broad-minded. <laughs> okay, and I think most of us actually 
I like that about most things in our life. And lastly, the lamb chops in my Buddhism for sheep, if you can, okay? This is a very important thing, okay? Because on the top it says special offer, here, George, special offer, lamb chops. And while the sheep is looking in the in the in the butchery, it says underneath, it is necessary to gain the insight that life is impermanent. Okay, now this is such an important thing in Buddhism for sheep, because I think also with all your stressful situations and your, all your anxieties, I think it's really important to know that it truly is impermanent and that everything is going to change in a minute. So it's better not to respond in, in a very quick way to everything that is there. So the last little story that I want to read you is called um, Rainy Day, Sunny Day. So there was once an old lady who cried all the time. Her elder daughter was married to an umbrella merchant, while the younger daughter was the wife of a noodle vendor. On sunny days, she worried, oh no, the weather is so nice and no one's going to buy any umbrellas. What will happen if the shop has to be closed? These worries made her sad and she could not help herself but cry. When it rained, she would cry for the youngest daughter. She thought, oh no, my younger daughter is married to a noodle vendor. You can't dry noodles without the sun. Now there'll be no noodles to sell. What should we do? As a result, she lived in anxiety and sorrow every day. Whether sunny or rainy, she grieved for one of her daughters. Her neighbors couldn't, could not console her and jokingly called her the crying lady. One day, she met a monk and he was very curious as to why she was always, uh, uh, why she was always crying. She explained the problem to him and he very kindly said, Madam, you need not worry. I will show you the way to happiness and you will need to grieve no more, nor deal with fear. The crying lady was very excited. She immediately asked the monk to show her. The master replied, it's very simple. You just need to change your perspective. On sunny days, do not think of your elder daughter not being able to sell umbrellas, but the younger daughter being able to dry her noodles. With such good, strong sunlight, she must be able to make plenty of noodles and her business must be very good for many days. When it rains, Think about the umbrella store of the elder daughter. With the rain, everybody must be buying umbrellas and she will sell a lot and her store will totally prosper. Don't live in hope for one child and fear for the other. The old lady saw the light. She followed the monk's instruction and after a while, she did not cry anymore. Every, instead, she was smiling every day and from that no, day, she was known as the smiling lady and hope and fear disappeared. Now, some of you may think to yourself, quite a stupid story. I mean, quite a woman, she could use her own logic. But actually, this story, we can't identify with that lady, but actually, it's the story of our lives. We live all our lives around hope and fear. Something good happens, and we on cloud nine, and it's wonderful. Something difficult happens, and we dive down into stress and sometimes despair. In other words, we live in hope and fear and orientate our lives around these two. We are living everything that we see, the good and the bad, is simply a reflection from our minds, but from the mirror of our minds. But we are living in the reflection when we live in hope and fear rather than in the true mind. And it's really, really important, this. And what I, I read the quote from the Kamapa last week, and I'm going to read it again, because I think it is so important, where he said, the true source of fear is this, the clinging to self, to identity. I'm just going to mute you, because somebody's, um, somebody's uh, what's her name, is really making a noise going to mute all of you and you unmute when you want to talk which can be any moment please okay 
He says the true source of fear is this, the clinging to a self, to an identity. He says because we see the self as separate, something separate, something whole, something that is solid and independent, therefore we fear losing that independent self. We fear being sick. We fear something happening bad to me. And he says, this is the source of all your fear and anxiety. That separate, separate ego. As soon as we have got that ego, as soon as we have seen ourselves as separate and solid, then we have to protect that identity. And that's where all our stress and anxiety actually comes from. Now, in, in this beautiful, beautiful book called Being Guru Rinpoche by James Lowe, it's a very interesting book because James, James Lowe speaks from his heart and he, and he uses swear words, he uses all sorts of things. He, it, that's how he teaches and he teaches all over the world and he had this crazy guru who was an amazing man. And so I think he learned just to be absolutely free from it. So this is what he said in the book. And I wrote it down so that I could share it with you today. He says, Padmasambhava's power arises from his fearlessness. Now, last week we spoke about fearlessness. We'll talk about it again. Padmasambhava Guru Rinpoche is not overcome by anxiety. He doesn't turn away from situations. He goes right into situations. He is the real yogi because a yogi is somebody who can take events and feelings, the behaviors that would normally tie people up in little knots and bind them to samsara. And he can use these very things as a means for liberation. Now, it's very interesting because in tantric um, philosophy, it says, the more negative emotions you are, the easier it is to live, you have, the easier it is to liberate yourself because those negative energies are made up of tons and tons of energy. And if we face that energy and use it in a different way, it actually transforms. And he says in the book, Tantra is about ecstasy. He says, what is ecstasy? And then he says, it comes from the word ecstasis. Ecstasy comes from ecstasis. And what does ecstasis mean? It means a stepping outside of yourself. By stepping outside of yourself, you can recognize, you can re-know yourself when you step out. He says, the self that we think we are, I think I'm Melanie, you think you're Kathy, you think you're Eugene, and so on. The self is constructed, he says, from assumptions that we make, from karma, from habitual tendencies. So in the practice, we visualize ourselves as these pure deities. And then we move out of the ordinary self to the pure aspect of our beings. Now, I've just given you a little quote from the book, but it was really very interesting when I read it because I thought, how do we step outside of ourselves and see who we really are? And the bottom line of everything about stress and anxiety is another view. When we step out and when we're not protecting the self that we think is absolutely everything, then we're, we're free. We actually are free. Nothing really, nothing really bothers us. You know, Zongsa Kienzi Rinpoche, and I listen to a lot of his stuff, and he says, he says, I wrote this 19-page thing on, on Vajrayana. He says, before I'd written the two sentences, People were already misquoting me. He says they were already using projections in their mind to misquote me. So I'm very careful of what I say about him because he says people misquote him. He says it doesn't really matter. But we hear what we want to hear. We get stressed about things that 
you know, the whole society tells us to be stressed off. We forget that we, what, what are we here for? What are we doing? We're just all the time trying, as I said last week, to make ourselves safe and secure. We think that when we're safe and secure, then we're okay. Now, there's nothing wrong with being safe and secure. Nothing wrong. But it always changes. And we have to look at the totality of why we're in a situation that we can't make our lives work out according to preconditioned habitual ways. We've got to look very, very deeply at these stressful situations that are being mirrored to us and see if we can really get those imprints that are ours clean. Because I said last week that people tell me it's their nature to be anxious. And I go, no, it isn't. It's your karmic imprint that makes you have a tendency towards anxiety and that makes you catapult into an incarnation where stressful situations arise all the time. And if you can see that, you can see that you're born into this so that you can learn to see it differently, especially where it's repetitive. You learn to see it completely differently, to handle it differently. And fearlessness is different to fearless. Fearless means without fear. And I was saying last week, fearlessness means full of possibility. It means I'm going right into everything to see what is there. And I was saying to somebody today, move into your stress. Move into it. See it. See it for what it is. It's not permanent. It's not you. It's not anything. Look at it and stand back and see what it is. What, are, what is being mirrored to you? It's your own creation. You created it and now it is showing itself. So fearlessness means you can get to a point in your heart that really touches your heart. You can even cry about it. And you can certainly feel it, but not become bogged down by it and believe that it's a despairing situation. Be courageous about your anxieties. Be courageous about your fears and feel them and see what is being mirrored back to you so that you can really, really change it. So last week we were talking about obsessive compulsive disorder in a in a not in such an extreme form. And the most important thing of the whole talk last week was when I said, all our pressures are not caused by external circumstances. They are caused and created by our own minds. Now, once we really realize this, it makes a huge difference because the people who are obsessive compulsive control freaks they are doing it because they can't look at their insecurity. They're doing it out of insecurity, but they can never look at their insecurity. They just look at how they can control everybody, how they can put everybody down and make them into the way they need them and under their control because they can't deal with unpredictability, with uncertainty. That's what we were saying last time. So they'll resort to any means. If you ask them in a very nice voice to do something for you, they will, or, or you asking them to not do something for you, they will turn the finger and point it in the other way. And actually, we can look at what are we so insecure? If a boss writes us, I mean, control freaks, will never let you have intimacy with them, even emotional intimacy, because it's into me you see. They don't let anyone see into them. They need to be in control. And when we look at it, and even if we do therapy and we go to the root in this life, I never go just to the root in this life. You'll see all the things in this life that made you insecure. The way your mother was, the way your lack of opportunity, loss, insecurity in your childhood, um, changing schools all the time, whatever it was, going to boarding school, whatever it was, you, you have all those circumstances 
And then people go in psychology using the human psyche. That's where your insecurity came from. Wrong. Because your insecurity came from all the insecure imprints from previous lives, which catapult you into these insecure situations. And if you don't learn what you need to learn, which is what I want to really go into tonight, if, if we are still busy preserving our separate identity of me, if we are preserving that separate identity all the time and clinging to the control that we've got, if we think we are separate from all these people and we've got to see that this never happens to me again, you know, people who come from, for example, poverty stricken, you know, not even poverty stricken, let's say people who come from families where there really was no money in the family and they always had to struggle for everything. So they weren't from starving families, but they came from families who really didn't have money and there were always problems around money in the family. So then if they say, when I grow up, I am going to see that I have total money and their whole goal is to make money so that they never feel that insecurity again. Have they resolved the stress? Have they resolved the anxiety? No. If you're in a circumstance in your life where you don't have money, it means a lack of generosity in previous lives. It means you're born into an insecure family because you weren't generous in your giving, not only money, but in giving everything of yourself. You kept it all to yourself. Therefore, you don't have the merit for money. Therefore, you're born into no money. And when you're born into no money, instead of people looking at the imprint and instead of people really saying, I need to develop generosity. So it's not about making money. It's about developing generosity to everyone around me. Now, when you can actually, when you can actually give generously to all the people around you, that means not only giving things, it means listening to people, it means taking note of people. It means accumulating that amazing generosity so that that imprint of not having money can really be overcome in its real way. Not that you make money as an adult and hold on to it for dear life and always fixating about, will I have enough for later? Will I have this? I won't do this. I'm saving for this. That doesn't, that doesn't resolve your stress. That doesn't resolve your anxiety. That actually creates more anxiety over the thing, you know, over everything. And then when we die, and that identity dies with us, with all everything that you had, it all dies out. We, we are really, really, this martyr, very, very, very afraid. And that anxiety has really got to be dealt with in a mirror around us. Good evening, Martin and Marion. Sorry you missed all the beginning. So to just go back to one other thing I said last week, and then we'll go on to some new stuff that Zonkar Kienzi said, Buddhism is never taught to make you comfortable. It's taught to shift you, to make you, in fact, quite uncomfortable because you don't really know who your identity is until you find the true identity. And so it's really to teach you your true identity. That's why it really throws you into the deep end of everything. Buddhism throws you in like crazy and throws you everywhere. And I told you last week that Chogun Trimpa wouldn't let any of his students stay where they were. And so when we look at all of this, Mark, we've just been doing a, a refreshing and Marion of what we were doing last week. So that's fine. We understand our lives are not predestined. And don't think of your lives as predestined. Think of your lives as giving you the opportunity to see the repetitive imprints and change them. 
And all the stresses that you've got in your life are merely your imprints. And so how you deal with them is what we're going to talk about now. When you use alcohol, weed, drugs, cigarettes, and of course, food, food's one of the biggest things that people use for stress, overeating, vomiting, anorexia, starving, binging, etc., to try and resolve stress, it's a short-term thing. And in the end, if you look at something like alcohol, alcohol is a depressant. If you look at things like sugar, sugar makes you mull if you have it in, in, in big quantities. And so actually it doesn't help you at all. And we're going to talk about the imbalances that actually come from, from having too much sugar. Oh, I just saw you now. That's nice that you're here. Um, but when you look at all of that, the weed, I've, I know so many people who smoke weed every single day and they actually tell me and they don't only smoke it a bit they smoke it for every stressful situation I've got so many I don't know really what to do with them because I say to them do you understand that over a period of time of regularly smoking weed as a habit and as a de-stressor you know the, the argument is well, people come home from work and they have a drink. Okay, if a person has a drink and it relaxes them, I suppose it's not a catastrophe, but why not relax with meditation, which then produces oxytocin in your body? But the bottom line is I watch people as they get older, the weed smokers. And what happens is there is no doubt in my mind, there is a dulling of the brain a cloudiness in there. They can't, they're no longer sharp. But they deceive themselves, which is about all of these things. I mean, the food relating the eating disorders are all around anxiety, desperately wanting love from parents, trying to fight against over-controlling parents. You know how many anorexic and, and, um, and, and uh, bulimic people I've seen whose mother was very over-controlling. And so their way of dealing with the stress of an over-controlling mother was to eat and vomit or not to eat at all and starve. Okay, and the mother couldn't control that. Did that ever resolve the problem? Never, never. The problem is resolved when you go right inside and you see the reason you've been born into an over-controlling mother, for example, is because of the, your imprint of over-controlling. Therefore, if you look at your mother and you really learn how to deal with your mother with compassion, with not falling for the ploys that happen, then everything starts changing. And then the stressful situations start lessening. It's so clear in my mind, many times the eating and the alcohol and the weed is all related to not feeling good enough. So when you smoke, when you smoke the weed, you feel okay, you feel chilled. Is that such a bad thing? I get this all the time from people, you know. But And, and often with these eating disorders and alcohol and weed and everything, it's an emptiness that people feel. They just can't feel their purpose in life. And so they eat to fill that, to fill that void all the time that they feel within their own selves. And when you look at it, it's absolutely amazing to see it. So I want to just give you the story. And then I, I want to throw it open so you can ask or give your comments with greatest of pleasure. And then we'll do a meditation because I want to go on to the chemical aspects and to the chur as a way of dealing with your demons inside, but in a different way that I want to deal with it tonight. So this was another Rachel Raymond story, a very interesting one. She says, another of my patients, a successful businessman, tells me that before his cancer, he would become depressed unless things went a certain way. Happiness 
was having the cookie. If you had the cookie, things were good. Um, if you didn't have the cookie, life wasn't worth a damn. Unfortunately, the cookie kept changing. So do the goals keep changing. Okay, the cookie kept changing. Some of the time it was money, sometimes power, sometimes sex. At other times it was the new car, the biggest contract, the most prestigious address. A year and a half after his diagnosis of prostate cancer, he sits shaking his head ruefully. It's like I stopped learning how to live after I was a kid. There was so much stress all the time in my life. He says, when I give my son a cookie, he's happy. If I take the cookie away or it breaks, it is unhappy. But he is two and a half and I am 43, okay? And so he says, it's taken me this long to understand that the cookie will never make me happy for long. The minute you have the cookie, it starts to crumble or you start to worry about it crumbling or someone take, trying to take it away from you. You know, you have to give up a lot of things to take care of the cookie, to keep it from crumbling and be sure that no one takes it away from you. You may not even get a chance to eat it because you're so busy just trying not to lose it. Having the cookie is not what life is about, he says. My patient laughed and says cancer has changed him. For the first time, he's happy. No matter if his business is doing well or not, no matter if he wins or loses at golf. Two years ago, cancer asked me, okay, what life, what is important? What is really important? Well, life is important, life. Life, any way you can have it. Life with the cookie, life without the cookie. Happiness doesn't really have anything to do with the cookie. It has to do with being alive. Before who made the time? He pauses thoughtfully. Damn, I guess life is the cookie. And I think it's for learning about the temporary, transient nature of all our stressful and our successful circumstances of our lives and go back to who we really are. So let me throw it open at that stage, and then we're going to go on to a few other things that I want to say. But I've said a lot and given you all the stories and everything, so maybe people want to ask or say, with pleasure, please do. Mel, can I ask a question? Of course, you can. So, you... you um. I've been with you for a long time and you used to talk a lot about the angels. And so if I am feeling stressed and whatever, because you have to, otherwise, you know, how do you deal with life and the events of life? A lot of the times I do work with angels and I just find that that really helps me get through my situations, you know, so I'm kind of not alone in it. So I was wondering how like Buddhism sees angels and work with angels and, I don't think Buddhism's got a bad feeling towards anything that's helpful to you or that really gives you that kind of security, okay? I don't think it's bad to have angels. The only thing I, that I want you to understand, and it's the same with the Buddhas, it's the same with the masters, it's the same with the guru. It's actually internal. So, if you find that finding an angel in you finding an angel to help you go through something is a way that you can calm yourself, that's fine. But now start looking at the angel as someone that is actually inside of you. Now, in Buddhism, it's very, very interesting because the Vajrayana practice, which is a deity practice. So people go, Westerners go, oh, you know, I'm, I, it's not for me. I'm Jewish. I'm Christian. I'm, I'm Hindu. Oh, no, Hindus have it. I'm, you know, whatever I am, I'm this or I'm that religion. And so I don't like doing all these external deities. But those external deities have never been external deities. If you want to see them as an external deity, 
no problem. If you want to see Guru Rinpoche as an external deity, that's fine. But if you really look at each of these things, they are principles. The angel principle would be very, very, very important because an angel is if, you know, when, when someone say, when you bring something to someone and they go, oh, you are my angel. You know, an angel is a really positive thing that you do for people. And you say to children, you are a little angel. You've behaved so well today. So that angel idea is part of your own inner being. If you want to see it externally, I don't have a problem. But we're trying to move away from duality. Everything in Buddhism is not about duality. But I fully understand and comprehend people that need to have God and the angels and things that are external to them. If you really look, even at the deep mystical Christianity and Judaism, God is within you. It's not the way we make it because from, from our moving into duality, we've always got to have a guardian angel or a God or something that's looking after us, that punishes us, that rewards us, that does everything. As soon as you take that idea, whether it be an angel, whether it be God, whether it be whatever, and you put it internal to you, then you are discovering what you meant to discover in this life. Because yeah. there is no duality. It's all oneness. But obviously, as human beings living in a dualistic samsara, we keep making these external things. So what I'd like you to do is by all means use your angels. They're beautiful. Angels are, you know, what we learn. Sits in heaven, plays harps, does all the good deeds, clears your obstacles. I do the same with Guru Rinpoche. But when I'm really in sound, sound state of meditation, then I know that Guru Rinpoche is a principle. Yes, there was a being that came to demonstrate to us what it was. But this book that I'm studying now, it's called Being Guru Rinpoche. Very different from Guru Rinpoche out there. A picture of Guru Rinpoche. It's in you. The Guru Rinpoche is inside you. And eventually when you change those duality concepts to right inside you, everything changes in your life. And the fear goes away because inside you, you've got these perfect qualities. Now, you have been through a lot of things in your life, hard things in your life. Since I met Marcel, I think she was going through deaths and bereavements and all kinds of things in her life. She's really been through a lot of heartache. But what a beautiful opportunity, open portal to unity to knowing that you've got everything inside you, that all these things were just what was necessary for you in your life so that you could learn something different. And when you give up that certain rigidity, that certain need to put everything into a place to make yourself secure, you'll see what will happen, how it opens up for you. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. And how you are accepting and how you begin to accept, I will always do a little re rebellion about something that's happening. I'll do a little scream, a little shout, a little whatever else. And then my husband's nodding. But then straight away, it's finished. I can't explain it to you. It would last for days, hours and hours in the past. Now it's finished. If I'm cross about something, I'm cross. If I'm stressed about something, I'm stressed. But goodbye, as soon as I sit down in my shrine room and I look deeply, then I know everything is just as it should be in the mirror of your mind. Okay. Any other things anyone wants to say or ask? Mm. So now, like... I think sometimes we get so used to hearing the teachings from a certain perspective that we don't even 
register it anymore. So like, and the terminology has become rote. So, so like, I think like, I watched a YouTube video the other day and like, it was kind of interesting, like it's the same as what we're describing, right? But it's just from a different perspective that so much of religion and so much of what we are taught is about so that when you go, you're okay. Like, so not, and the thing is, it's like, you have that peer potential now not saying I'm anywhere close, but like you have that pure potential now and like the the teachings is like, like you said, it's like that opal portal to unity is being in the present. It's like all of this is there to bring you here now and reach your full potential beyond your ego now. But there's all the karma that keeps you in the loop and, and, and the donic treadmill. But it's very interesting. But it's like, I think because so, like, I think sometimes people use the religion actually to suppress their energy, to suppress their gifts, to suppress joy even to a point where it's not about chasing pleasure and, and like that kind of stuff, but it's like, breaking through all of your mental fixations and thinking of what you are to actually really reach your true potential and to do as much good on this realm as what you possibly can do and to be a force of good like Akong Rinpoche did and Lama Yeshe is doing and the Dalai Lama is doing but it's tough because we don't have a lot of support structures in thinking this and like a lot of the religion in our country is like, yeah, just be a good boy. And then when you die, you. <laughs> Drives, <laughs> say, you don't know how many people. Oh, how yeah, many but you people. can do it now. You can no, you, you do this now. No, and I talk to people after they die and I say, you died now. But the thing is, don't wait until the death because you need to, we need to do exactly what you're saying. And, you know, last week I was saying, where Taisitu said in this age, we've advanced so much in technology. When I watch the AI on the television of what they do, I my mouth is open like this. I, I, cannot, believe, I, know, I cannot believe how they create these what's the name verses, whatever you call them and everything. I just, I, you know, I sit there. I mean, it's like another language. But at the same time as all the sophistication has happened, the suicide rate is higher than ever before. And that comes Isolation. from your, your very point. And why? Why do people commit suicide? And what I was ending with last time was I was saying to you that Zongkha Kienzi said, it's a habit momentum. That is so frightening that suicide is a real habit momentum that we've done it in many, many lifetimes. But sometimes people are so desperate about life about the anxiety, about not being enough, about fear of not getting through whatever they've got to get through, about not getting love, forlorn, despair, gloom, thinking they're being punished. Um, you know, sometimes they kill themselves because then they think all the people around them are going to really feel sorry when they're gone for when people have committed fraud. I mean, you hear of these businessmen that go into Sancton and all over and jump off a building, you know, where people are because they've, they've just, their fraud has just been exposed or for loss of money or for failing in life or success and so many reasons why people take their lives. Now, just think about it for a minute because it comes out of this unbelievable anxiety and stress. And why would people think that if you are very unhappy and very, very dissatisfied with everything in your life, why would you think about killing yourself? Why wouldn't you rather think about fixing it up? Because if there is a problem, there's also a solution. The solution came before the problem. So the solution is there. Now people think when I've killed myself, as you just said, 
I'm going to sit in this glorious thing and it's all heavenly and there'll be rainbows and I won't have any more of the stress. Now, when you die and after the first two bardos, you are then in a mental body. Now, think about what a mental body is. The elements that make your physical body turn the other way around and now you're in a mental body. Now, a mental body means whatever you think you are. So if you think about your family that you just left, you're there. If you think about hatred or anger, you're in the hatred and anger. The mental body completely exposes everything that the mind is. So if just think about it. So people think, but now they're going to go into love. And then you read these comments from the people left behind. People go, peace at last. Peace at last. I remember one drug addict that I was dealing with that really, she, she was absolutely amazing. She came right. She came to me. She came to my groups in those days. She was really doing amazing. And then one day she said to me, Hillbrow is calling me. In those days, it was Hillbrow. You know, she said, Hillbrow is calling me again. And I said, don't you dare. She was going to go back to school. She was going to go back to everything. She said, Hillbrow is calling. Well, Hillbrow called her until she overdosed and died. I didn't say to her, well, now you're dead and this is where you're going. I said to her, you better see that in death, you still help all the other drug addicts that have died on an, of an overdose. You better do something really with what you've learned now. Take it and do what you've learned. Don't feel sorry for yourself and don't feel this and don't feel that. I said, because you're going to see it right in front of you. Just go and do what you need to do to help and rescue all the people. I've had many dreams of people who've committed suicide. And I've been thrust into the sleep state with them. And they are in turmoil. That's what's so sad about it. Because how can you not, if you're now in a pure mental body with all your thoughts in front of you? No. Let's clean up now. It's not to make you afraid. Sorry. What did you want to say? That's because people don't know who they are anymore. Yeah. Exactly. They have no time for silence. Phones have taken that away. It's social media driven. You have yeah, to be this 100%, 100%. image. 100%. So when that you. falls away, that whole image, that whole life purpose, that whole Alice mm -hmm. is gone. Like, so then they can't cope because they don't know who they are. And like, and there's so much pressure these days to be online all the time and to be available all the time. So you never have time to, that's why meditation is becoming harder and harder to do because the world is expecting you even on weekends. Hey, I sent a quick email. Can you respond to our executive? Okay. <laughs> it's terrible <laughs> what you say, but we've got to change. Well, let's do a meditation and then let's just quickly look at three things. One, the chemical reaction in the brain to stress and then we'll finish with stress tonight number two the three visions and number three just a little bit on their true practice and what it really really means okay and i did it this week so it was a wonderful one it's a wonderful release when you're able to do it i haven't been doing it for a long time but i did it this week and it was Really, it is an amazing practice. So I want to just talk about that. So let's just do a little meditation carrying on from last week. Just looking at yourself. So I want you to just breathe in and breathe out. And come to this moment. And just for a moment, see everything around you. It's temporary, transient, impermanent. Just watch the waves of the ocean. The waves of the ocean rise up however big they are. 
crash back into the ocean or gently go back into the ocean. But they absolutely join the ocean. The ocean is your mind. We can't catch the wave. Just as we can't catch our thoughts and feelings, our stressful situations, we can't catch them. We can't fixate on them. We can't hold on to them in any way. So just breathe in and breathe out. Come to this refreshing present moment. The past is gone and the future hasn't been made. And hope. When we live in hope, I hope this is right, I hope this happens, I hope that happens. When we live in hope, it's a clinging, it's a fixation, it's a wanting of things to be the way we want it, when maybe it would not be the best thing that happened to us. Just remember how many people say to me, the worst thing that happened in my life turned out to be the best. And my eyes were wide open from that. So I want you to take your little stress demon, whatever stresses you the most. If it's a situation with one of your children, if it's your boss, who keeps on putting you down, if it's a person at work, if it's a fear of money or not having it, if it's the world state, just look at all the things that stress you out and try and almost see what the thing is that stresses you the most. The things we habitually do, like avoiding situations we are not competent in, or procrastination when we should do something and we don't do it, and it goes on on a regular level, or fearing people will find out things about you that you've kept secret, or always hiding in the background of gatherings never allowing yourself to give your opinion or not having or your children not doing well. Just look at the thing that stresses you the most. And this evening, I want you to put it in the chair in front of you and look at it. That's what we were doing last week and we just continue. I will be very happy if you can name it and give that little being in the other chair a name, like procrastinator, avoider, on me. Always putting me down, little demon. The fear demon. The one that always tells you that you won't make it. That things are bad and gloomy, the gloom demon. Give it a name. And now communicate with that demon. I want you to look really deeply. If let's say your demon's the procrastinator. And as you're about to do something, you find yourself distracted and going to do something else. And that little demon is always making you put off things because it's scared that you won't succeed or you'll find something out or it won't work. So it keeps getting you to procrastinate. And you listen to that little voice inside you. Now I want you to see that and ask that little being, what is it that you need from me? I need to make a truce with you. 
I need to look at you. I need to understand what you are saying to me. I need to face you. You are so important in my life. Because wherever I am, I hear your little dooming voice inside me. I know you are there and maybe you are trying to save me, actually. But it's not helpful how you are. I'd like you to just be able to be strong and give me courage. I need you. I don't want to get rid of you anymore. You are a very important part of my important energy. Help me. Help me. Let's see what the little demon says. Because maybe when you acknowledge it, when you see it, when you are aware of it, it can change and help you in a different way. So you say something like, if you would not pull me down every day, if you would rather say, be careful because of this, or just be, be, be aware of this person, or you need to get a lot of strength today because you are going to have this boss telling you what to do in a negative way. If you just warned me, but in a positive way, we could work together, the two of us, so well together. I need to see you in this light. I need to really take you in and understand what you are doing for me. I need you to integrate with me. No more getting rid of you. No more blaming. No more shaming. Just nudge me and tell me instead of saying to me, you'll never make it, you'll never make it. That sentence you say to me is so hard. If you just say to me, just be careful here. Breathe in, breathe out. Face this thing you have to do. If you just say it to me with a strength rather than a putting me down, we could really be one. Now, if you practice this a lot, with your demon, you will find that there is a transition and that demon starts to help you and you work together, not to get rid of the habits, to face them. What are they deep down? What is my need to control everything deep down? Am I so insecure? Do I need to control everybody around me? Maybe I should just let go and let everybody be where they need to be. You need to do this work on your own, everybody. You can do it with Sultra Malioni's feeding your demons, or you can just do your own. But just make a little truce to work together and not fall down every time into the deep distress of all the life circumstance. Make that truth. Work with this, everybody. Work a lot with it. It works so much. You'll find that when you've worked with it, if you just sit for three minutes, five minutes, and you just look at it and you name it and you ask it what it wants and you really together, you do it. Now, in the chair practice, like what you do in the chair practice is you do the poor way, which is the transference of the consciousness. So the other night, I was doing this poor, I thought, hmm, it's very pleasant when you actually go. So you transfer your consciousness out of the Brahma aperture into whatever you want, Amitabha, whatever you want, it doesn't really matter. But it's really transferring your consciousness into the light. And then what happens in the practice is 
that you as Vajra Yogini go down to the dead body. Now I've transferred my consciousness into the light and Vajra Yogini chops the body up into little pieces. She chops it up. I'm just gonna I'm gonna just silence you for the moment because somebody's got a noise that's coming through. So she chops up the body and then she makes a nectar out of it. And then the nectar is fed to the demon. Now that nectar is your truth with the demon to say, you know what? I'm feeding you my body, I'm giving it up, I'm collapsing all my delusions. I'm feeding you. Vajragini makes a beautiful bowl of nectar and then she goes to all the demons of your body of, around everywhere and she feeds them. And it's such an important practice because you can do this in actual fact. It may sound like a fantasy, but I can't tell you how wonderful I feel after I've done that practice. And what's important is that when you feed the demon with the nectar of your body, so you're not going to feed it with the nectar, you're just going to feed it with, I offer you myself, I know who you are, I want us to work together. It's called pacification. So instead of saying, ah, why do I procrastinate? Why do I keep pulling myself down? Why don't I believe in myself? Instead of doing that, that doesn't help you. You actually pacifying it you say okay there's a reason there's a reason why this happens and you're feeding that reason instead of getting rid of it so it becomes integrated into you and the fear and anxiety is gone so the first step is to name that demon and pacify it it's really very important the chu means to cut through that's the interpretation it means to cut through because Machik said befriend the demon because they're actually within us they're not outside they're within us they're the forces that we fight inside ourselves and they undermine our best intention so feed them instead of fighting them now, in Dzogchen, there's the practice of called breakthrough. And they say it's like, remember that game we used to play, pick up sticks. So it's like you put all your emotions in a bundle like this, in a stick bundle, and then you let them go. Okay, And they fall all over. The solidity breakthrough is when the solidity falls there. Okay, And it's really amazing because Milarepa says, Take a demon to be a demon and it will harm you. Know that a demon is in your mind and you'll be free of it. Interesting, isn't it? So, Pammy, when I next hear you saying, you know what, Melanie, I don't know how to do this. I listen, and I don't know how to do this, but um, you know how to do it, but I don't know how to do it. The next time I'm going to say, let's feed your little pull-me-down demon. <laughs> let's feed it. The little demon that says, I'm listening, and I know, and it all makes sense to me, but I'll never be able to do it. Of I course, say that, can you do that power practice with us? Yeah, the poor practice is for a different the poor practice is for a different thing because we can do it as a we can do the poor practice if you like we can do it as a session you know a whole session how you do the poor practice and what it's all about but in the chair practice is the poor because it's like you transfer your consciousness and there's the body chop it up and feed it to the demon now when you have your heart and you feed it to the demon, it's amazing, absolutely amazing, because the demon starts changing, and then it becomes your friend. So now next time you're going into the boss's office, the demon would normally say, you know, he's going to chop you up. Okay, he always does. This time when he's become your ally, he says, now remember, stand firm, 
Don't have to be rude, but stand firm for what you believe. Tell him your feelings. You know, something like that. So the demon has now changed his string and he's now helping you to face the circumstances of your life. It's amazing. Let me tell you, it really is amazing. And when I've done the chirp practice, I feel like a different person. Because I go, I feed all the demons in South Africa. I feed all my own demons, my family's demons. I put them all dedicated there and then I do the practice. And then the nectar goes into the mouths of everybody. And everybody, it says in the end of the practice, everybody goes home satisfied. What a lovely thing, you know. So let me just quickly do two little other things with you before we go. And the one is that, you know, Tukton is very good at teaching this. That from your brain, from the amygdala, you get cortisol. Cortisol is your adrenaline, your fight flight mode. Now, you need that cortisol. If you're in a really difficult situation where you have to run for your life, you need that cortisol because the cortisol is fight or flight, okay? And it's the adrenaline that makes you go. And sometimes you really need that cortisol. But oxytocin is called the stress-relieving chemical, okay? Where there's much more compassion. And meditation produces oxytocin. To understand those two chemicals, it's, it's, it's actually quite easy because when a baby is born, it, the body produces cortisol. Why? Because from the tightness of the womb, the baby is birthed out into the cold and the cord is cut. So it needs that adrenaline. It needs that fight flight. And you hear it because then it goes, where? Okay. But once they've heard that, then the baby goes up to the mother's breast, drinks, and produces oxytocin, which is the calming, compassionate um, chemical. Okay. So when stress, we need to produce oxytocin, but our habit of fighting or flighting and getting adrenaline takes over. So we need to generate the habit of producing oxytocin. So when we are stressed, the cortisol, it leads to when we really uptight, you have cortisol released from your brain, okay? And if you then take sugar or alcohol to release the stress, it makes it worse. So when you've got a stressful situation, the best thing you can do is to step into your meditation place and do some meditation, breathing in and breathing out and sitting and being in the present moment starts producing oxytocin. oxytocin. Now, once you've got the oxytocin, oxytocin released from the brain, then you can look inside and see what to do about the stressful situation. So in actual fact, if you were in an earthquake or a hijacking or something, the best thing you could do was to produce um, oxytocin because you know, that would be the best thing to know what to do or if you were going to be in a plane crash. Instead of adrenaline and people panicking and people screaming and producing a fortune of cortisol, which doesn't help you at all, you stop and you sit and you just breathe in and breathe out. You come back to yourself and the brain produces the oxytocin and then you can look clearly into what you want to do without the fight and flight um, adrenaline going crazy in your body. And that's a very important thing. And I just want to do one more thing. Then we could just have, I wanted to try and finish early, but I just want to do one more thing so we can leave the subject matter. Is that 
when you are doing this oxytocin and cortisol, we have to be aware of the three types of vision that there are in the world, how we view things. The one is the karmic or impure vision of ordinary beings. So that is just your absolute illusory, illusory vision where we, where we actually, it's just dependent on the karmic causes and it's illusory. So the vision, the impure vision, and we could do this again another time for, uh, with something else. The impure ordinary vision is that when you've got a stressful situation in, in front of you, you actually look at it in terms of your karmic imprint and that's useless, actually, because you're going to see it all wrong. You're going to resist it. You're going to fight it. You're going to fly away from it. It's no, not helpful. And then the second vision is the vision of the experiences that arise to practitioners. Now, that's still illusory, but it's purer vision. So when you're doing your Chen Rezi practice and you're filling yourself with compassion and you're filling yourself with that beautiful image that I am the deity, that is my purest self, that is a much better vision to have. And the third vision is the pure vision of realized beings. And that vision is seeing things as they really are. So if it's something, you see it exactly as it really is not through your karmic vision, not through all of that, but exactly as it needs to be. It's very important, that really very important. I just wanted to say that one of ego's goals is to always feel better out of everything. And the high expectations to always feel good and on a high often land in disappointment, terrible disappointment. It's really important to understand. So when we understand these three visions, the impure illusory vision, the pure illusory vision, and seeing things exactly as they are from your true nature of mind, to go from the one vision to the other takes a lot of time and a lot of practice. But when we practice, all those old ideas, the illusory ideas start dissolving. And eventually we start to look at things like what Eugene was saying earlier. That's when you are looking at things as they really are. It's not easy because the world isn't looking at them like that. But at the same time, a lot of you who've been studying for a long time and practicing for a long time will start to be able to do this. And that's really, really important. So just let's have one or two questions and then we will close the subject and we'll do something different next week. Anybody? Mel? The oh, go ahead, Mark. Mark, go. Um, so the, um, I think the moment I, I dialed in, there was a a subject about you were talking about unity and then later uh, Marcel was talking about angels and you know you were talking about seeing the angels inside and um and so obviously we 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 seem to be trapped always in this uh, seeing us separate from and ending up in duality rather than in unity is it correct uh, that somehow the, the of the eight consciousnesses that the seventh consciousness is somehow if i can say that although it's also part of us of course but it's tripping tripping us up but i haven't really fully got it and i wanted to ask you if you can not maybe not now but in general if we can maybe talk about that and and see if it's so important when you understand how those consciousnesses yes. work, sense consciousnesses, the mind consciousness, the yeah. mind consciousness is not the problem. Yes. The mind consciousness labels what it sees. Yes. And it is that pleasure consciousness, that mm -hmm. emotional consciousness that then 
attaches and fixates or throws out and doesn't throw. That's the seventh level of consciousness. Yes. And it's that level that gives us all the troubles. And then the mm. eighth one where all the imprints are, mm. you know, that we make. I mean, I just, I, I, I just sometimes think to myself, I mean, if we could just be more cautious and yeah. even children, like some of you've got beautiful grandchildren or little children, and you teach them to just what they say, to think about it carefully, like I don't want this and I want this and I need this and I don't need this. You know, those attitudes that come in the seventh level of consciousness are what drives us mad. That's why I don't know, you heard, did you hear the story on the cookie? Yes. But maybe you didn't hear the story on hope and fear of the woman who, you know, who wants sunny days for her, her noodle mm. daughter and rainy days for her umbrella daughter who <laughs> sells umbrella. And then I said, we all like that. Mm. Just looking for the good all the time and we're hanging on to it. And we are we're evicting the bad. But meanwhile, the bad, in inverted commas, is the actual teacher. It's the actual mirror. It's the actual thing that really, really, really gives us an eye. As I said, I will still shout out because I'm so mad about something or so annoyed about something or whatever. I'll shout out, but then I always calm down and then I look deeply at whatever it is. And then I have a different view. Very mm. different. And it starts, first, you can't do it at all and you just respond and you go with your, your impure vision. Then you start seeing things in a different way. So you might still fall for it a bit, but then you're able to quickly get back and see it. And eventually, you just don't fall for it at all. You know, I've learned so much from Zongsa Kienzi Rinpoche. He is such, he's such an amazing master because he just is as it is. He never puts highfalutin things and everything. So just to give you this for a last example, it was amazing. He was teaching the, um, and funny, he was teaching in Berlin, you know, but he was teaching this huge group of people who were obviously Sogil Rinpoche's, Sogil Rinpoche's students. And you know, there was, I don't know if you know, there was that whole controversy with him and everything. And so they were asking him questions. They were firing the questions. And they said, what should you do if your guru tries to have a sexual relationship with you? And it was absolutely amazing, his answer. Because he said, is it right? Is it wrong? What is it? And he said, if the guru was a Mahasiddhi, in other words, a really attained, enlightened master, he may have a reason for clapping you or, or, or doing something very negative for you, which might be for your enlightenment. But that's how you look at it. You look at it. You don't look at it just as a negative thing. You look at it and you see what it is that you've learned from it, how it is. He's absolutely amazing, you know, when he says that. He never says you're wrong and you're right, and this is wrong and this is right. He just gives you to look deeply in yourself. And isn't it about that? It's the most amazing thing. Yo, Eugene, that's fine. I'm going to just end and then we can do some uh we can do some um talking if anybody wants to ask me anything. So you know what, Kath, can you do because Poor Fiona, she may be back online, but can you just do the dedication for us? Thanks, Kat. So we're really dedicating for all the people who are going through stress and anxiety, the people who are fleeing from Sudan right now, not able to get out or are able to finally get out. For all the stress in the world, we really pray that just a little bit of goodness and merit will come out of our being together and sharing this subject matter. So through this merit, may we all achieve all seen Buddhahood and thereafter, once all harmful enemies have been defeated, may all beings be liberated from the ocean of existence, stirred by the waves of birth, old age, sickness, and death. 
Sonam di e tamce zipane, topne ne pe dranam pamshene, che gana ci bala topaye, si pe sole do a do war show. It's very important the dedication because we have to really dedicate everything that we do for the good of all beings 